should say is also up to the speakers about whether they take those points. If they choose to do so, then we hope they will. Please then feel free to speak. If they don't, please just let that. And before you speak, please state your name and colleagues and wait for the microphone to reach you. So you can use your attention. Um, that's everything for me. Our first speaker this evening is Dan Jarvis. Dan is a Labour MP for Barnes and Central and formerly an officer in the Harris Division. Thank you. Mr President, the question we ask ourselves tonight is as relevant now as it was 80 years ago. For me, though, it has a straightforward answer. Yes, sometimes it is right and necessary to use force as a country, or at least it is the best of a range of bad options. So I would fight for Queen and country. Indeed, to do so is, I believe, a duty, a duty I have performed on several occasions. For me, this duty was and continues to be an essential form of public service. A sense of duty took me into the army and kept me there through some tough times and some good times. But it was that same sense of public service that brought me into politics. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a nat natural consequence to that. And that consequence is that war is hell, and it never turns out how you expect. It carries a terrible human and moral cost, and that in turn gives us a burdening responsibility for the way we fight and for how we reach the decision to do so. Tonight, it is this consequence which is so fundamental to this debate that I will address. Ten years ago, I was in the deserts of Kuwait, awaiting a move into Iraq. I knew then, and I know now, that the business of war, the stark, bloody reality of war, is anything but glamorous. Even when the conflict is small and the victory is great, destruction is wreaked, people are killed, and lives are wasted. And even with the best efforts to the contrary, often many of those people are innocent. Since 2006, more than 12,000 civilians have died in Afghanistan. In Iraq, more than 110,000 civilians have died since 2003. More than 600 British soldiers have died in these conflicts, with thousands more injured. Vast sums have been spent, £25 billion by the UK in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and a trillion dollars by the US. And as Iraq demonstrates, the consequences of war, the costs and its aftermath can be much, much greater than predicted. The enemy's casualties count too. Some were fanatics and full of hate, but many others fought for money or because they were young men looking for a cause or because they were driven to fight by the abuses of other powerful men. But my experience has taught me that few Af happy. Surely the situation you, uh, you point out is just two, two groups of mostly young men both fighting for, like, uh, for, for country, right? I mean, I mean, like, in which both sides you know, are simply fighting out, 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 out of what they believe to be, to be their national duty. Like, so, uh, in, in which case, can we really say that, that, uh, that, that the one, one side's more just if, if the cause is, 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 is basically the same for both sides? Okay, th thank you for that point of information. I think if, if you bear with me for just a moment, I will come precisely to that point. My experience taught me from my time in Afghanistan that few truly supported the Taliban or their ideology. In Afghanistan, the Taliban do many things that are unquestionably evil. Schools burned down, doctors, teachers and aid workers killed, children used as suicide bombers. But if we simply label these men as evil and stop there, we excuse ourselves from the need to confront the true nature of the conflict and its true cost. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are to fight, we must be ruthlessly clear about the cost, both moral and physical. And this cost exists no matter how just the course. 
So what does this mean? This means that great cost has great responsibility. The decision to go to war is the most serious that a politician can take. It should be the last resort. But we should also recognise that we have opportunities to try and prevent conflicts at their source. The prevention of war, of bloody fighting and sacrifice, may mean many things. Addressing the underlying sources of conflict and tension, strengthening international governance, reducing nuclear weapons, creating a more just and equitable world, action to alleviate poverty and the prevention of environmental crises. We must try to change the system, not just react when it produces a crisis. Afghanistan, I think, is a good example. We have fought with bravery and with sacrifice. But if from the start the ISAF allies had treated the underlying problems of Afghan politics and governance with the, with the hard-edged urgency of national security, I believe that we could have reduced the levels of conflict. We also have a responsibility to ensure the efficacy of the decision to fight. The process must be exceptional in, in its scrutiny and in its transparency. As a soldier, my duty was to carry out the decision to, to use force to the very best of my ability. As a politician, my duty is to scrutinise the case for that decision with a ruthless and dispassionate care and in sorrow, not in anger. That's what I tried to do when we were de debating the decision to go into Libya and the current events in North Africa may yet offer a similar test. For a leader, there must not only be a particular sacred duty to take the country with you when you commit it to war, but utter clarity about the way in which the case is made. And if war inevitably has a moral cost, it's all the more important that it be fought in a way that minimises it as far as possible. But the one thing the terrible cost of war does not mean is that it is too awful to ever contemplate. I wish it were that simple. But the truth is we live in an imperfect world where both action and inaction have consequences. We have to decide between them without fully knowing what those consequences will be. Yeah, happy to give away. George Galloway was... Ex Sorry. Yeah. Was it said that uh, the most patriotic thing that a British soldier could do would be to refuse to fight and was expelled from your very own party. So I just don't think that really says much about like, the ability of politicians to sort of scrutinise conflicts as they see fit. Well, I I if I might say so, George Galloway was expelled for, for a number of other reasons uh, as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, and not ones that he would necessarily want to talk to with his constituents in Bradford West. But you raise a very interesting point. I, I, I'm trying to addre address precisely the concerns that many people will have had about the process that took this country to war in different places. And that's why I've just said that it's incredibly important that the process must be exceptional in its scrutiny and in its transparency. I just said um, that one thing that the terrible cost of war does not mean is that it is too ever, or too ever awful to contemplate. I wish it were that simple, but the truth is we do live in an imperfect world where both action and inaction have consequences. We have to decide between them without fully knowing what those consequences will be. Given the facts we faced at the time, I do not believe that it was wrong, that it was the wrong decision to use force lethal force in Kosovo, in Sierra Leone and in Libya. In these countries, conflict was raging before we acted. The alternative was not peace, but massacre. We had a duty to act and to intervene. I'm just going to carry on for, for one more moment because time is, is running short. So if our aim is to take the path that results in the least human suffering, I doubt it is ever reasonable to do nothing. Now, we can all think of examples that are less clear, or indeed reasons why the ones I've cited were, complete, were incomplete successes. But the point is, there are no perfect options. Politics, war and life are never neat. They are always messy, imperfect and less than ideal. War really is hell, but in real life, there are times when there does not seem to be any alternative. 
I believe that we have a duty to recognise this reality and do all that we can to avoid its necessity. There is no easy moral position to take in this debate. We need the strength to face up to the reality, the heavy burden, the duty which is on our conscience and our judgment on how we undertake the responsibility that has been placed upon us as best we can. Our true duty is not to avoid conflict at any cost, but to make damn sure that it is truly necessary. Search our conscience and then fight well for Queen and country. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Thank you, Dan. Opening the case for the opposition is Michael Codner. Michael is the Director of the Military Sciences Department at the Royal United Services Institute. Michael. Thank you very much. I have to say in opening that I agree with almost everything that the previous speaker said, just that I would not draw the same conclusion over whether we would fight for Queen and Country. If I could just explain my own position, I work for a think tank, although it's called the Royal United Services Institute. Um, we are completely independent of government, we're a charity, and uh, my own research area is military studies, uh, and I'd hope that what I study and what I present is as useful to a Quaker um, as it is to a government which has probably messed up one uh, defence review and is planning to mess up the next one. <laughs> um, and speaking of the Society of Friends, I would make the point up front that I'm not opposing this motion from a pacifist viewpoint. I personally never bagged a doctorate, as many of my present colleagues in my job did. I was roaming the oceans during my youth as, uh, in the Cold War as a naval officer, and I suppose you could say that um, in this context, I'm a mere master and commander. <laughs> and my contention in opposing this motion is that queen and country is an outdated jingoistic concept, which implies that the motivation for people joining the armed forces is patriotism in the face of existential threats. In no sense do I want to disparage um, Queen Elizabeth, a national treasure and an international treasure, perhaps after the Olympics, but let's consider the concept of the head of state, not her in particular, in a general sense. Indeed, if Britain wasn't a monarchy, we'd be talking, looking back in recent history, about fighting for Blair, Brown, or even Cameron Clegg um, and country. The concept of a sovereign does, does give us a convenient focus that allows us to dodge the reality of committing our young men and women to battle at... The, um, uh, uh, at the behest of particular governments. And what of country? The United Kingdom itself, as an island in the North Atlantic, is one of the safest places on Earth from external threats. There is the internal threat of terrorism, but doesn't that have something to do with our violent expeditions overseas? Where, if there was a direct threat to the territory of the United Kingdom, as emerged after the debates on this motion in 1933, uh, where are the direct threats? Well, of course, I'd fight, but I'd be fighting for my family, my children, and my friends, and their families and friends, and by extension, the wider community. And as a country, we know full well that we can't take on that task alone. If we were to do it, we'd do it as part of the NATO alliance, and doing that, uh, pushing the country line, we'd be actually fighting for 28 countries, and more if we include other European Union nations not in NATO, NATO and other allies through the treaty arrangements somewhat more. Or it could be that Britain was not under threat, but some of these other countries are, so we'd be fighting for them first and foremost, not ourselves. And this brings me back to the issue of recent expeditions. If British service people are fighting for their country in Iraq, and Afghanistan, one expects that country to be pretty clear about why they were there. Were we? Are we? And will we be in the future? Let's skip back to the 1990s, the first Gulf War, 
Bosnia, Kosovo, East Timor, and Sierra Leone, the force for good decade. It was rather clearer then what our service people were fighting for, to enforce international norms and for humanitarian reasons, to stop atrocities, the responsibility to protect, issues that um, the proposer has already mentioned, and I support entirely. These norms are, of course, important to the security of this country, but it's the principles, not our country, our service people are fighting for in those situations. Now, what about the Falklands? Surely that was queen and country. Well, that doesn't seem to be the view of government. If you read the recent white paper on the overseas territories and listen to politicians' rhetoric about the wishes of the Falkland Islanders, you can come away with the conclusion that our overseas territories uh, are something of a responsibility. They are a global archipelago, but something of a responsibility which is residual after empire for the British government following the end of empire. These territories are too small to look after themselves uh, and to be independent, so we have to go on looking after them. And if they want independence, that's their choice. They can have it. So they're not part of our country. Setting aside Scotland for the moment, I don't think Cornwall would have an option to become independent. That's what country means. Surely what the government has said recently and what the government has said in the past is the right of self-determination of the Falklanders to decide which country they're part of. They've chosen repeatedly and have expressed repeatedly that they wish to be British. Their decision decides whether they're Argentine or British or independent, but they've made the decision to be British. So surely when we fought for them, we were fighting for our countrymen as they decided to be. I certainly take your point, and um, I accept your point. What I would say, though, however, is not that is not what you can draw from government white paper. And if we're talking about what we mean by fighting for queen and country, do we mean by what uh, government is actually telling us that we're there to do? One could take the queen and country argument along a different path. Britain spends a larger proportion of its GDP on defence than most other European countries. Indeed, most so-called Western countries, excepting France and the United States. Why, if we're safer than most, will we spend all this money? We could guard our shores, and indeed the overseas territories, uh, at a much lower price. The strongest argument for this premium is global influence. Our military prowess beefs up our reputation and gives us more clout internationally, and in particular in influencing the behavior of the mightiest power for the time being the United States. And this reputation is sustained by military commitments and doing them well. Both this government and the last argued this last influence point. That's what defense policy is all about, influence. So is this what queen and country is all about? Our military expeditions, which involve a lot of fighting, are to do with keeping our country as a major power with a seat on the UN Security Council. And that's also where the huge investment in the nuclear deterrent seems to fit in most comfortably. Not to make Britain safer than Germany, Canada, Australia, or Japan, but because it means influence. But is there any real evidence that Britain's spending on defense does bring influence, does alter the course of history? In particular, does it modify the behavior of the United States? The war in Iraq is not a good example of our commitment bringing influence to the better. The British public might accept that we spend more on defence as an influence premium, but there shouldn't they have some evidence of this? I feel that this is a fundamentally important issue for this debate. And this brings me to the point back about military intervention to maintain and sustain legal and moral norms. I certainly wouldn't challenge that this is a reason for wealthy Western nations to fight. Liberal intervention is a key element of the defense policies of Scandinavian countries, of Canada, what Mike McGuire called the Northern Lights countries, if only we were one of those, and of course Australia and others. And these countries all spend a lower proportion of GDP on defense than Britain does. 
It's not about queen and country. Funny, funny, however, how many of them are monarchies. But... Thank you. Um, I put it to you that, that one of... I put it to you as an Australian that the only reason Australia spends less on its defence, uh, you know, according to its GDP, is because of the Australia and New Zealand and US uh, security treaty. You mean you're being looked after by the Americans? Yes. But can you manage the Americans to make sure they look after you in the way you want? There's a big dispute in Australia, I think, between the extent to which you need to woo China and the, to, to the extent to which you need America on board. I'm not saying a dispute, but that's certainly a challenge for Australia, isn't it? Is it really America that's going to be your future, or is it perhaps coming to the right sort of accommodation with China, with America in mind and all of your other friends and allies? Anyhow, we can take that on later. Yeah. Anyhow... Um, the United Kingdom certainly has a reputation for good diplomacy, for being typically on the right side of moral argument. But is it really the military instrument that supports that? In closing, I'd like to make one final point. And this is about the motivation of the service people themselves to fight. I know that Tom Coghlan will address this in much more depth, and he has much more experience in theatre than I have. But if you ask a wise soldier or a sailor or an airman what is central to military ethos, it's loyalty to your colleagues. You don't fight for queen and country, you fight for your mates. Why do young people join the armed forces? I was talking to a recently retired army officer earlier this week. She, she has an 18-year-old son who's about to join the Royal Marines. Why does he want to join, she said. He's young, he's fit healthy and lively and bright. The problem is that there aren't enough mammoths to slay anymore, and that's why he's joining the Royal Marines. Another piece of anecdotal information, a recently retired senior Royal Marine officer who has wide experience in Afghanistan, came back, has been very um, uh, disenchanted by his experience, and he said that the issue that has most haunted him since he came back, on the one hand, was that he's not been able to save the lives that he was there to protect, and the other hand, it's the people who died under his command. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't have to be jingoistic patriotism. There are a lot of other reasons, many of them noble, to fight. Thank you. We will now take a short floor round to give everyone have to, uh, the chance to have your say on the motion. Um, please do wait for a microphone to reach you before speaking. State your name and college before you speak, and please do keep speeches to a maximum of one minute. Does anyone firstly have a point they'd like to make in proposition of the motion? Proposition. Take it in the, in the blue, then. Uh, Thomas Milligan, Churchill College. Uh, the opposition was making the point that rather it would be better to go to war for moral reasons or a noble reason, but surely the role of the government is to decide as a country which moral values we should go to war for, not as an individual person. Now, a, can I have a point in opposition of the motion, please? At the back. Uh, thanks. Hannah Graham from Selwyn. Uh, you said that uh, we should decide what moral values we, as, as a country, should be fighting for. I, and the, the opposition said that... Uh, there are reasons other than queen and country which are better reasons to fight. I would say that while there are obviously reasons for which it will be necessary to fight, I mean, you can go for really obvious examples such as, you know, First, Second World War had very little choice. But I would say that the idea of fighting for queen and country is not only wrong, it's a dangerous idea. It's dangerous because it encompasses 
these ideas of aggressive patriotism, of nationalism, of the idea that a certain group of people are more similar to you because they happen to live on the same bit of land. I think there are things that it's vital to fight for. Sometimes you have no choice, and sometimes it's a moral imperative. I think there are very few times when this is true, but I accept that sometimes it's true. But I'd say that not only would I not go to war for queen and country, I think it would be actively wrong to do so, specifically for reasons of what is essentially nationalism, which when this debate was initially posed, it wasn't so much of a problem, and then it became quite a significant problem quite quickly. Um, and I think the idea of nationalism is one that is expressed in the title of this debate, and I think it's one that we should all vote against. And finally, for now, can I take an initial point in abstention of the motion, please? That means you're not voting either for or against it. No one? Yeah. Hi. Uh, Sam Price, Trinity Hall. I think it all comes down to a matter of context. Um, in the first debate 80 years ago, they're sandwiched between the great war to end all wars, in which so many people have seen the loss of so many of their families and friends. And it's just a horrific thing. It's just come behind them. And in front of them, they've got the Second World War, which is looming over them, Hitler's Germany, <laughs> about to invade Poland after having taken over so much of Europe already. And I think the situation we find ourselves in now is so different to what they found themselves in then that it's very difficult for us to make any reasoned judgment as to whether it's right or not to go to war for our country. Thank you. We will have another floor round slightly later on in the evening. But to get back to our main debate and continuing for the case for the proposition is Lieutenant Colonel Keith Smith. Keith is a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Fusiliers. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, it's a great honour to be here and to speak to bright, intelligent people. This debate takes place 80 years after the infamous Oxford Union debate of 1933. The motion there was that this House would not fight for king or country under any circumstances, and Oxford voted in favour. The shockwaves from that debate were to reverberate through the country and indeed through Europe and the wider world. It gave the impression at the time that Britain would not fight. That Britain was imbued, possibly understandably at the time, with a spirit of pacifism and a, and a desire that on no account would it fight. Six years later, Britain, as we all know, was plunged into World War II. By 1940, Britain was fighting for its very survival. Supporting the motion at Oxford in 33 encouraged, I would argue, an aggressive attitude from abroad, and it was based on a fallacious argument, this blind hope, really, that no war would come. At the time, there was a 10-year rule, and there was a belief that we just almost stick our heads in the sand and no future war would come. Churchill, commenting at the time, had talked about the idea that Britain and France had, chosen, had to choose between war and dishonour. They chose dishonour. They will have war. And, of course, it was to come. I considered, what does this motion really mean? First of all, the word fight. This means, clearly, that you will join Her Majesty's Armed Forces and you may be called upon to fight. However, I think it's important to realise that you will be called upon to fight in a last resort. This image uh, that you have sort of bloodthirsty army types uh, who just can't wait to get at it uh, is simply not true. Okay, when diplomatic negotiations, etc., economic sanctions, international cooperation have failed, then it is likely uh, that you may have to ultimately fight. How could this happen? Firstly, you could join, by choice, the regular armed forces. Secondly, you might join the reserve forces. You might, although it's unlikely in a modern army, volunteer to join at the last moment in a time of crisis. Lastly, you might fight in what I would call a citizen army, similar to sort of World War I. Obviously, up to 1916, there was no conscription, so it was truly a citizen army. And in World War II, although there was conscription from the beginning, it was, in essence, a citizen army. The truth is, that's very likely to unlikely to happen in the modern age. Simply, Joe Public is not skilled enough. We're not, if we have to start mobilising all of ourselves, we are truly in crisis. 
<laughs> no, no comment on any of you, but I'm just suggesting. Um, <laughs> Macmillan, when asked uh, what he feared, said, events, dear boy, events. We cannot presume to know what is going to happen. And one of my arguments is that in reality, when we say we would fight, it is the threat that in the end, if our values are threatened, we will defend them. Moving on, it talks about... Uh, fine. <laughs> I hope. Harry Peter, Clare College. Um, would you defend the values of any country just depending on where you were born? If you were born in any other country, would you still fight for Queen and Country on their behalf? Uh, good question. Um, I would fight for a country if, uh, ultimately, let's be honest, soldiers themselves do not decide that they're going to fight, except maybe on a sort of Friday night after a few beers. What we're talking about here is the idea that our democratically elected government has decided that our national interest is at threat and therefore we will fight. Uh, going on, we're talking about the idea of sort of queen and country. What does it really mean? For me, it means that in essence, we're fighting, I suppose, for a figurehead. Um, I was grateful indeed uh, to the opposition for making a cogent argument for monarchy and against republicanism. The, um, for me, you've got the idea that you are fighting, okay, for a democratically elected government. This government we vote for, and we have to, in the end, ultimately trust them. Clearly, the average soldier doesn't believe that they are fighting ultimately for the monarch. They are fighting for their state, and I agree with the idea, which came from the sort of opposition, that you're fighting for your mates, your comrades. But nonetheless, it are, I would argue you are also argue, fighting for your family, your friends, common values, and that, for me, is indeed your country. You're also, and I think it shouldn't be decried, we are fighting for international influence. At times, we have got to show that I think that we wish to be uh, at the top table. <laughs> Lastly, on this issue, this House would fight for Queen and Country. In all eventualities, you're only going to fight if you're a volunteer. You are choosing, ultimately, that you're going to join the forces. We, in turn, as a nation, uh, honour, broadly speaking, the military covenant, and it is our duty to try to look after the military. The respect, I would argue, which uh, the military are held in are shown by things like the ceremonies at Wootton Bassett, obviously the annual Remembrance Day parades, the cenotaph, etc. I do not sense at the moment, indeed I would argue at the moment, popular opinion has probably never been so high in terms of its support for the military. To quote Cromwell, put your trust in God, but be sure to keep your powder dry. Okay, we have to be ready at times and ready to fight. Quoting George Washington, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. We have to be ready. You cannot tell. No one clearly wants to engage uh, in wanton war. But nonetheless, I think we have to be realistically military, militarily prepared. Finally, I was thinking, why would we fight? Ultimately, we are fighting for our own national interest, for democracy, our own survival. Some wars are much easier. World War I is simple. Um, World War II, I think, is fairly simple. The Cambridge, uh, the Cambridge Union was founded in 1815 at the time we were in a mortal struggle uh, with Napoleon. Maybe we wouldn't be here discussing this uh, if things hadn't quite gone the same way. Shared values, security. Afghanistan, the government has decided, is vital to our security. Anti-piracy patrols off Somalia, the Falklands... Uh, there was a discussion there, but the people of the Falklands, in that sense, I think in a broader sense, are part of our country. We, the army often will have to fight, for example, in Kuwait in 1991. There was a perception, that, a, or not only a perception, a reality, that a country had been invaded, was asking for help, and therefore it was in our interest to help them. I think it's important, though, to say again about this fighting and how it would be authorised. It's authorised by a democratically elected government. That is very, very, I think, important. And to quote Burke, I venture to say that no war can be long carried on against the will of the people. We may debate that slightly, but nonetheless, in principle, uh, a democratic government uh, sanctions war. I think it's also important in this motion to discuss what we're not talking about. Um, we're not talking about the imperial excursions of the 19th century. We're not talking about things like the opium wars in China. That is irrelevant. We're not talking about wanton imperialism and jingoism. The days of sort of Palmerstonian foreign policy and ascending the gunboats uh, to defend after Don Pacifico has long since gone. You know, we've grown up. What if we didn't fight? What if we didn't fight? 
Given my premise that we will only fight when our national interest is absolutely threatened, ultimately, if we say we will not fight for what we value, we are going to simply sacrifice our way of life. Oh, far away, if that's not incorrect. Wouldn't, um, wouldn't you consider the opium wars to be fighting in Britain's national interest? Mm -hmm. Well, they perceived it was, but I think now that we're a more mature society, we'd probably argue that it wasn't. But they certainly considered that they were fighting in that sense at the time uh, in support of trade. I think that is true. Uh, I'm, I'm decrying that sort of thing, to be perfectly honest. I'm saying in a modern age, and a more realistic... We are, we are, no, we're a post-imperial power, and we need to realise realize it. So I'm simply saying, that we, uh, to conclude, that when you're considering this motion, if you say that you would not fight for Queen and country, and for the values for which that stands, you have to accept that when the chips are... Thank you. When the chips are down, you would be prepared to sacrifice your way of life. There were plenty of arg arguments I could conjure up. Of course, many of them are historical. You know, if the few in 1940 had decided they wouldn't take off, uh, it would have been something of a sort of a risk. In the modern day, I think what our armed forces are doing, for example, in Afghanistan, is vitally important to our security. And I'd simply like to finish with a quote, maybe surprisingly, by George Orwell. We sleep safely in our beds because men stand ready in the night to visit violence on those who would harm us. Now, it may not be nicely put, the idea of visiting violence, but the truth is that ultimately, it seems to me, people will fight for Queen and country. Those who have chosen to do it, uh, I think we should be grateful. It's not for everyone who wishes to do it, but for those who have, I think we should be sort of grateful to them, and they are simply defending, ultimately, our way of life, and I commend this motion to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Director of the Global Policy Institute in London and a Professor of Government, Professor Stephen Hasler. Mr President, uh, members of society, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm a great pleasure to be here. And I want to start, because I'm on this side of the House, by being absolutely clear that I am a patriot. Um, because I'm a Republican and take this view, often people don't think I'm a patriot, but I always say I am. And I once uh, gave this ringing statement in Australia, as a younger man, Australia got up, uh, in which I got up and I said in a meeting, I said, you may hear a lot of me against Queen and country today, but I am an Englishman, I was born an Englishman, I've lived as an Englishman, and I'll die as an Englishman. At which point an Australian got up from the back of the house and shouted out, young man, have you no ambition? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have ambition and I am a patriot and it's not any part of our case that uh, we on this side of the house should not have a love of our background, if we have it, a love of our family and friends to fight for them. And it's none of our case either, has been pointed out very eloquently by our first speaker and by others in the audience, uh, uh, that we are pacifists. This is not a pacifist debate, not wholly a pacifist debate. It's a debate about war and queen and country. And on the first point of war, the first point I want to make is on the question of war and force. Most of us of my generation now, getting on, grew up in the shadow of the Second World War, which was, quote, a good war, a strong, clear war with a moral purpose. The problem has been recently, certainly in the post-Cold War period, that the wars and the, and the uh, conflicts we've been drawn into have by no means been as clear as that, have by no means had the moral dimension and fervour of the Second World War about them, but instead have been often, often, British people and British soldiers and the British state going to war in the interests of the United States Republican administration. It's a fact of the matter. The point about Iraq, of course, is that it was an invasion of a country 
that didn't ultimately threaten us. Large numbers of people died, both our own people in the West and Iraqis, large numbers, invading a country that didn't threaten us uh, and, in fact, did not, at the end of the day, have weapons of mass destruction. So the question is, it's not a question of force. It's not a question of force right or wrong, necessarily. It's often a question of getting your wars right. And lately, I'm afraid, the British government has got its wars wrong. And if one looks at Tony Blair, and one takes the very important point made by the second speaker for the proposition that we have democracy in the West to determine whether we go to war or not, the people determine, the parliament determines whether we go to war. Tony Blair took us to war in Iraq without so much as a by your leaving consulting the British people. Labour members of parliament who went into a previous election, not arguing for a war in Vietnam, Labour members of parliament went through the lobby to send this country into war against a country that did not threaten us at the behest, basically, of George W. Bush because Tony Blair wanted to be a global celebrity and wanted to be Secretary of State in the United States. Now, that's war in our time, because there are good wars and there are bad wars, and there are problematic wars. And this whole idea of uh, Britain overextended with its imperial memories, uh, still going to war, still in far-off countries, Afghanistan. My God, we were out there on the northwest province where we hundreds of years ago. We're still there. Imperial mentality. Still ruling our thinking. But I think the essential point of this side of the house is, I would like to make, is not just a question of the right war and the right use of force as against the wrong use, but the whole question of queen and country, which this debate is actually about. And I'd like to pose this question. Our first speaker on this side said Queen and Country is a highly old, has a highly old-fashioned ring about it, and indeed it does. And I'd like to pose this question. Which country are we talking about when we talk about Queen and Country? As far as Britain is concerned, which country? Are we talking about the Scots, the English, the Welsh, Northern Ireland, different countries? Are we talking about the North or the South? Are we talking about our elites in Westminster and in the banks or the ordinary British people? Are we talking about middle class people or the oligarchs who run this show increasingly? Are we talking about those on benefits <laughs> and those not? Are we talking about rural England or urban England? What is this whole, uh, this whole deal that suddenly when we go to, to war, it's as one? We're all acting as one. When we have a highly divided country, we hardly have one country at all. We strive to have one nation, which is a great and marvellous idea, a Tory idea as well as a Labour idea, one nation. But we're striving for it. We haven't got it. So you have to ask the question, which country? Please. Thank you. Uh, Nye, again, Peter House. Uh, I actually, I, I put it to you, sir, that you and the preceding um, um, opposition in this case have actually put, are actually on the wrong side of the bench. Now, you argue that one should not fight for Queen and country. Your predecessor argued that what we should fight for are our friends, our family, our mates. But I don't know about everyone else here, but for me, Queen and country is not a sod of grass. It's not the belief that it's the land under our feet. It's not an imperial approach to the other country. It's a desire to put England on the world map. What it is, is the Queen as a symbolism of the land, the land as a representation of my friends, of my family, of my mates, the people I work with, the people I live with. Okay. And the only reason that I can live in that society with those people are the values, the principles, which overarch society and which I believe that Britain continues to represent. I don't fight... Gordon Brown, I don't fight for Cameron, I don't fight for Blair, I, vi I fight for the country that they, as our government, represent. Fine. Fine. <laughs> Quite right. 
quite right. But is it one country really? Are we really one country here? Are we a unified group that looks after each other, thinks about each other? We have Labour MPs from the north of England here. Completely different world from southern England and the banks and, and central London. I don't want to get them into trouble, but... Uh, what is this one country? When the conservative leader, Benjamin Disraeli, raised this one country, he was saying we were two countries. Maybe we're three or four. And it is this attempt, in my view, to develop a common theme of common interest between people who have different interests, fundamentally, that is fundamentally wrong with nationalism, a point made at the back of the hall. This nationalistic notion, which is constantly evoked, to try and pretend that we're all in this together when you know we're not, really. Nice to think we were, but I'm afraid we're not. And on the question of queen and country, the monarchy symbolizes the country, does it? Unaccountable head of state. No one asked them. When Prince Charles takes over as king, no one will have asked him to become king at all. He'll just take over. Unaccountability. Uh, monarchy, representing the average family in Britain, the way they live, the way they think, represents Britain? No. It represents some mystical idea of an imperial past. Look at the pomp. Look at the ceremony. Look at the empire. Look at the stuff they still trot out. Honorable members. All this kind of stuff that they surround themselves in the House of Commons with an upper house and a legislature that isn't even elected, determining our laws and giving the monarch a veto and a House of Commons, which is a, has a majority government normally, based on 42%. So, right, I have one minute remaining. I'm getting too excited about this. Uh, <laughs> so my basic point is, I understand the motivation completely of fighting for friends and family and background, and mates. But I don't understand the motivation of fighting for this broader, nebulous concept, particularly when you tie it to an unaccountable, extremely wealthy, privileged family and institution which is not remotely like the rest of us. And let me finally end on the question of nationalism, because it has been raised at the back. Uh, and bring this up to this business of this old-fashioned notion of queen and country. I do think that we do in this country look too much to the past, too much to our traditions. They're good traditions, some of them. They're bad traditions, others. But we do look much, much too, too fervently to our past, to our imperial past, which many people still haven't got over. By the way, uh, when we hand out orders, right? Order of British Empire, when there isn't one. I mean, which empire are they referring to? Uh, this is typical, this is a typical thing of a country that has not overcome its imperial past. And what it needs to do is to become a modern country which indeed understands that the force of nationalism is not only bad from the point of view of whipping up further, uh, uh, leading to unjust wars often, often, but also is not really relevant to the present real world we live in, which is a globalised world, in which small nations are no longer able on their own, unfortunately, to deal with great world problems. So for those reasons, I oppose Queen and Country. I would certainly honour the valour of the gentlemen here who have fought uh, in wars, and it's no case of ours to be pacifists, and it's no case of ours not to respect their service. But I think it is a case of ours to say that fundamentally queen and country is far too old-fashioned a concept, leading us back into a past when we were an imperial power, and that the fundamental reason when people go into war, as far as I understand it, I'm not as nearly as expert as others, but they've told me themselves this, is to fight for their mates, to fight for their family, to fight for their friends, not to fight for a remote and jingoistic idea like queen and country. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We will now have another floor round.
Same as before, please wait for a microphone. Say your name and college before you speak. And please, no more than one minute. If that makes me nationalistic, then fine, because, frankly, if it's the nationalists, they're wanting to promote some sense of peace within community, that wants to stand up for peace, that wants to actually do those hard decisions that do take moral fibre, then, frankly, call me a jingoist, because I'll be one any day of the week. Thank you, Ingram. Can I now take a point in opposition of the motion, please? I, Marion, Clare College. Um, I've been a little bit perturbed again to hear uh, pacifists so roundly um, rejected and, and discounted by both sides of this debate. Um, we've, we've heard a little bit about sort of last resort warfare and about um, you know, going in only if it's necessary, but I think hearing two sides of a debate about fighting uh, takes so for granted that frequently violence is the only solution to something or that frequently war um, is it the first way to go? I'd like to hear a little bit more about some of these things that can be attempted before going in uh, with a sort of violent opposition to something or, or with a violent effort, effort to overthrow something. Um, and I think that in general in this debate, not fighting at all is an option that should be more considered. Thanks. Thank you. And a point of abstention, please. Hello, Anna Lamport, uh, Munim. Um, I was just wanted to um, raise a question to the House about um, the uh, Queen Elizabeth land in Antarctica. Would we as a House consider that our country and fight for it? Thank you. Uh, we're going back to proposition, please. I think it was Voltaire who said, I don't agree with the word you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Isn't that something that's particularly relevant in this house tonight? We have freedom of speech. We have democracy. We've chosen our government. We have the right to do so. When our government decides to fight for something, isn't that something we should do? Maybe if our government's deciding wrong, that's the government. It's not the principle. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take another point in opposition now, please? James Bailey, Pembroke College. Um, I think I'd just like to firstly reject comprehensively the idea that um, we sort of live in a perfect democracy where the government implicitly is always going to precisely reflect the will of the country it's trying to serve. Um, I think that I, I did a little bit of playing around with one of the BBC's election calculators before the last election and it turned out that they reckoned that it would be taken into account turnout possible to get a majority government on about just under 20% of the British people. Um, so I think that that is, that is something of an issue with the question of democratic mandate. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about is this idea of country. What is country? Um, and we, we talk about the things we value and there's been this attempt to associate all of them with country, to lump you know, friends, family together. And of course your friends are in, you know, probably mostly in this country, your family are mostly in this country, but actually a lot of my friends aren't in this country. I have friends who are Greek um, or from Croatia or Australia or America and I value those people and would want to fight for them just as much as to fight for the people at home. And I value their freedoms just as much as I value the freedoms at home. And I think that fighting just for this country is too narrow. I, would, I think that there are things worth fighting for, and I agree with the proposition on what those things are, but I think that they're worth fighting for not just for this country, but for the world. <laughs> Thank you.
Would anyone like to speak in abstention again? Hello. Um, Tom Hoyer, Pembroke College. Keep it on. <laughs> Tom Hoyer, Pembroke College. Um, and also a member of the Cambridge University Air Squadron. Um, my, my point obviously must be neutral. Uh, it's a question, really. Um, so we have two situations. 80 years ago, the shores of Britain were threatened. Now we live in essentially peace. The only threats to us are foreign powers, of which we know nothing. I think that's the point. Um, and what I think is that if uh, at present there is little sense of nationalism because we are so divided as Scotland, Wales, England, the north, the south, if England or Britain were once again to be threatened by a large dominating opposing force, I believe that then nationalism would come into focus. War would unite us and we would fight against it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do one more round so I can have a final point in proposition of the motion, please. In the middle. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Watts, Kat. I was just wondering about this point of country, um, whether or not anyone else saw the Olympics I saw. Um, it seemed pretty clear there that not only are we aware that we are one country, not only are we not divided as to south and north, I'm pretty sure no one here, if they come from the southeast, would like to dissociate themselves with Jess Ennis or indeed Mo Farah. Um, I think it also proved that we can be friends with people from other countries, but respect our country. I think also, besides the Olympics, it seems a little naive to think that there is some way we can dissociate ourselves from the idea of having a country. I mean, if it was so easy and if countries were so nebulous, then I don't think we'd have quite such a pressing issue with war. You know, it would be quite hard to fight a war when we weren't in one country and someone else wasn't in another and we weren't representing either one. And finally, you know, an army is made of thousands of people. Whether or not you're fighting for your values or your beliefs or... Your friends or your family, essentially, each individual person can't make that choice. We're just not that smart or that unbiased. A final point in opposition, please. Uh, in the back corner. No, behind, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Elias, again, Pembroke. Um, that's actually a really interesting point that was just made, um, that it's hard to have uh, w wars um, you know, without the con conceptions of countries to fight them. Uh, and, yet, and yet somehow we've been in Afghanistan uh, for so many years, and the country of Afghanistan hasn't actually been uh, you know, one of the bodies that we're fighting against. Um, it's been this kind of right, like loose coalition of, of, uh, of, of, various, um, of, of various armed forces and... Uh, I, I think it's important to remember that the notion of war is very different now than what it was even a few decades ago, um, that not only are our armed forces um, sort of a lot more confusing in terms of uh, how many uh, you know, hu hu human beings actually are fighting where, um, but also in terms of what what goes into the decision-making process? Um, we, we, you know, there's this idea that maybe a representative democracy uh, can somehow decide to to, to go to war uh, on behalf of of, of a country. Um, but given that one, we have you know this entire sort of NATO alliance. Two, we have a pretty large, you know, glo global sy sy system of pretty scary corporate interests kind of consistently pushing um, uh, industrialized nations into, in, into, into, into wars in, in sort of non-Western countries. I think it's a lot more difficult uh, to make that claim. Thank you. And one last point in abstention. Thank you very much. Domna Michaeli, Dunyunam College. Okay, that's working. Um, I entered this house and I was sure that I would exit it from the no side. 
However, I'm quite perplexed with this um, concept of um, a jingoistic country. Um, I think that you might be quite disillusioned if you think that this country or this land does not, does not all unite together. Uh, I come from a country, and then I have to go back to the Olympics point, I come from a country where we, we um, regained the Olympics with a great zealousy. However, what happened is that we had not seen anything like this sort of mass hysteria with Team GB. If this summer you were in London, I, I was not there, I was here, but wherever you would turn your head, that's what you would see. Even if you had your eyes closed, actually, that's what you would listen. Uh, so I do think that this country, wherever you want to be, call it dangerous or not, I'm not sure, but definitely in the corner solutions, if you want, can unite and uh, acquire a nationalistic spirit. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much to all our floor speakers tonight. Back to our main debate and closing the case for the proposition is the Labour MP for Durham North, a current member of the Defence Select Committee and a former Minister for Vet Veterans, Kevin Jones. Thank you very much, Mr President. Can say thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. And can I begin by congratulating the... Uh, last speaker uh, on his tactics. It's a tactic that I've used on a number of occasions. You throw around a lot of uh, controversial statements to wake your audience up, uh, try and humour them with a few jokes that uh, try to ensure that uh, you can empathise with them, and then try and boil down the arguments to some very simplistic black and white issues. And I've got to say, uh, Mr President, this issue cannot be uh, put down to the black and white or even the humorous way in which, with a great uh, way which the former speaker did it. This union debated uh, the, uh, the, the same motion in 1933. It's quite clear uh, that the world today is a lot different from uh, it was then. We've had some semi not only political, social, and cultural change. I look around this room tonight, it makes me feel old uh, in terms of the faces I see. I just look what's happened in my lifetime in terms of the change in technology, social attitudes, and uh, in terms of the way in which society is more questioning about uh, what its governments and its leaders actually do in their name. I hate to actually think uh, what uh, perspective the last speaker sees in the uh, span of his lifetime of changes that have taken uh, place. <laughs> There's one thing that hasn't changed uh, in those uh, since 1933, or I would say in the lifetime of the previous speaker, uh, and that is the <laughs> ability to predict the future. Um, the, the future is uh, uncertain. It was uncertain in 19. Uh, 33. It is, uncertain, it is uncertain today. Is there a debate that we actually have to have in this country about our role in the world? Yes, I think there is. Are we at a turning point, uh, I think, in our history? I think we are. But I don't accept the argument that you can define wars by good and bad wars. Uh, I think it's not only simplistic, but is also looking through the prism and the ability of hindsight. And I just touch on Iraq for uh, one uh, moment. The common view now is that Iraq was a mistake and that we actually, uh, if we'd known what we know now, what would have... Well, we can all say that not just in terms of decisions we have to take in politics, but in daily life uh, as well. I asked people to go and study the immediate months before Iraq and look at the actual... Uh, UN reports from Hans Blitz and uh, the uh, evidence that was put forward was considered on that. That is the evidence on which, at a time, politicians have to make uh, a decision. I had the privilege, actually, the night before the final UN resolution, being in New York and spoke to Hans Blitz, who I've got to say I had a lot of respect for. I've got to say, possibly, is changing uh, uh, his view of history afterwards because. I still have a notebook at home in which I asked him a direct question is, uh, what next? Uh, and his view was quite clear that uh, without full cooperation, 
Uh, did, I asked the question, did he need more time? He said, no, not without full cooperation, and that's not what we're getting. So I do hasten to add to say that you've got to uh, understand that politicians do take decisions on the facts as they see them at the time. And I think we also need to remember in terms of Iraq, this idea that somehow the Prime Minister at the time uh, took this decision solely. It was the first time that we actually took the decision in Parliament to actually uh, vote for the war uh, in the invasion of uh, Iraq. Are those decisions easy? No, they are not. And as Dan said, this is a last resort in terms of uh, decisions that we take. I voted for uh, uh, the war in Iraq. As a minister in the last Labour government, I have taken decisions personally, which I know, that have led to people losing their lives. Now, is that easy? No, it's not. Do you actually uh, make those decisions flippantly? No, you do not. Do you actually uh, feel that you've made mistakes on occasions? Yes, you do. Um, visiting, as I did on numerous occasions, the wounded in uh, Sally Oak uh, Hospital. Uh, did I actually think that some of the decisions that I'd taken personally had led to some of the horrific injuries and the deaths of the family, uh, family members that I actually had to meet as part of my role in the Ministry of Defence? Is that something that you can uh, accept? Yes, I think that is the burden which you ask modern day politicians to actually uh, carry uh, with them, but they're not easy decisions, and they've got to be made on the full, uh, or what is perceived as the full facts at the time. What is clear to me uh, is that uh, when this debate was taking place in 1933, uh, again, if we'd had hindsight at that time, would we have been arguing for appeasement, which, you know, we've got to accept, and you know, I suggest people read the newspapers of the day. This was the fashion. Appeasement was the actual in thing uh, to actually be supporting. No, we wouldn't. But they did not have uh, the ability to foresee uh, the future. So today, Jason Allen Darwin College, is the motion this house would fight for Queen and Country, or should this house fight, or should this house have fought for you and your government? Well, no, because the, the point is, is this, is we ask people to lay down their lives uh, on uh, our behalf in terms of a country. Uh, the idea that somehow the last speaker was trying to suggest that Her Majesty uh, uh, is the person who is directing this, is not. We're a democratic country which, uh, in uh, a situation, we make decisions. I think Iraq was a good example where Parliament took that democratic decision to go to war. We then ask our military commanders to do that on our, our uh, behalf. But I think in terms of, well, you, the, you know, the general shouts from Central Tradition, uh, a payroll vote. Well, I'm sorry, if it would actually been in Parliament at that time, and the, ang uh, the angst which a lot of people went through to actually make that decision, it was just not payroll vote, and I, ex I don't accept that uh, for one minute. And there were real difficult decisions, and good friends of mine who voted against the war, and I respect their uh, positions and what they did. But are the threats different today? Yes, they are. The, the threats we face uh, today have clearly changed in terms of uh, the uh, threat we have from uh, Islamic uh, extremism. Uh, also, that we're actually now dealing with non-state actors. The, the days possibly of large, uh, uh, you know, nation-on-nation -nation, uh, wars at the moment, seem a thing of the past, but I, I hasten to add that we shouldn't turn a blind eye to uh, both the parts of the former Soviet Union, Russia, or uh, China in terms of that, um, uh, in terms of our preparation. The threat is also different in terms of, is it just about what Dan and I used to use uh, on many occasions, I'm sure Keith did as well, the use of kinetic force? No, it's not the use of just kinetic force. We have other threats now in terms of cyber, possibly biological and nuclear threats, which we certainly didn't face in 1933. And that does pose questions, I think, not just for uh, us as politicians in terms of making decisions, but also for how we form uh, and actually um, you know, uh, develop our strategies uh, for the future. We can learn from history 
but history, as we know, never actually repeats itself. And we shouldn't actually live in uh, our his history. But I think it is important that we don't fall into the trap which they did in 1933 in terms of the 10-year rule, the idea that successive governments would work on the basis that the uh, country would never go to war within uh, ten, uh, those 10 uh, years. And I am concerned that at the moment we're into that uh, idea that somehow Iraq is finished, Afghanistan is, is drawing down, and somehow the, the threat is not going to be there uh, for the future. What we do need, and I think there is a, a moral side to this in terms of ensuring that what we ask our armed forces to do, not only that they have the equipment and actually training and ability to do it, but also there's that genuine debate about what it is as a country we need to do in terms of how we would actually intervene. The last speaker talked about good and bad wars. I presume what he was saying that he considers Iraq as a bad war. But that, I don't think, should be allowed to trumpet the shame. It is a shame and stain of uh, the situation that happened in uh, Rwanda. The government stood, uh, the nation stood by and allowed a truly tr a tr trustee to uh, carry on. In terms of what is in our national interest, that, I think, is something which is debated and needs to be debated. Do people from my constituency or Dan's constituency who uh, join the armed forces go to fight for uh, queen and country? Uh, the queen is a symbol, and the monarchy is a symbol, I think, of the uh, nation. Uh, if you ask the young recruit from Durham, his motivations, I think, the same as possibly uh, his great-grandfather who uh, came from the Durham coalfields to fight uh, on the Somme. It is about protecting the freedoms which we take for granted in this country. It is also, I think, we, we, we can't forget this, is that it is no good thinking that this country can be some type of isolated bubble, that it can insulate itself from the rest of the world. We are now an increasingly interdependent world in terms of not just our commas, but in terms of the way in which the global uh, economy and global society works. So that's why it is important that we do have the ability to project force when we actually need to do it. And can I just finish in terms of what Dan said? Should it be the last resort? Yes, it should. Is it right to use that in terms of uh, the interventions that have taken place, for example, recently in Libya and Iraq? Yes, it is. Are they always going to be difficult decisions for politicians to take, and decision makers to take, and be uh, a matter of great concern and debate by society? Yes, they are. And so they should be in terms of making sure that politicians and those making decisions are kept and held to be account for their decisions. Thank you, Kevin. Our final speaker tonight, closing the case for the opposition, is Tom Coughlin. Tom is the defence correspondent at The Times. Tom. Good evening, and uh, thank you for having me here. Is this working all right? Is it okay? Firstly, to return to the proposition, this house would fight for queen and country. I want to warn of the dangers of fighting for queen and country for both moral and practical reasons. The notion of fighting for queen and country is outdated with a raft of ugly connotations. It is too often an echo of empire and is a call to nationalism, as we heard earlier. And I say it's irrelevant today. The second warning that I want to make is, is with the actual experience and the benefit of financial, moral, and spiritual of fighting for queen and country. And this second point is based on what I've witnessed um, during the past decade of working alongside British soldiers in the wars that they fight. Let me start improbably with the girl guides. Uh, they've been facing a problem. The problem is the oath that every girl guide says every week. There's 500,000 of them in Britain. Some of you may have been girl guides. It goes thus. I will do my best to love my God, to serve my queen and my country, to help other people, and keep the guide law. 
The wording, according to, the girl, to Girl Guiding UK, has become increasingly problematic. There are more and more girls and leaders, this is a quote, who struggle with the wording, particularly interpreting what it really means to girls today. God and service to queen and country are both in retreat in public life, in, Br in a Britain that is increasingly multi-ethnic and multi-denominational. What binds us today is not blood, but values, and values cut across nationality. Go ahead. Um, yeah, what, what is the most peaceful country in Europe? For the past 500 years, Switzerland has managed to get away without being invaded by any of the aggressive powers on its borders. Why is this? Why, what is it that's put off the Napoleons and the Mussolinis and the Hitlers of the past, it's because for the past 500 years they've had conscription. They've had a, an armed force that, although they're not, they're a peaceful country, is willing to stand up to defend them. In fact, they've exported mercenaries all over Europe. So I would put it to you that a country that's willing to defend its borders is one that can unite, despite having people who are Protestants and Catholics, despite having, having French and Italians and Germans in the country, they can unite because they have someone who will defend them when push comes to shove. And for these reasons, is it not something really important to defend our values, to have a force that will be willing to do it? I just respond to that point by, by saying that Switzerland is great for skiing, but it's not much use to any invader. Uh, it's also got great, you know, horrendous geography for invasion, and, and that, I think, more than the efforts of its citizen army explains why it hasn't been invaded. But if we... Very nice views. Uh, and chocolate, and cuckoo co clocks. Uh, but but um, yeah, if you look on... If, if you go online and you, and you type in this um, phrase, king and country, queen and country, uh, what, what pops up in front of you is, I think, instructive... Uh, there are purveyors of toy soldiers from the imperial era. Uh, there's a, uh, a, an online uh, game called uh, uh, Fight for King and Country, which is uh, about world domination. Uh, and uh, there's even a band called For King and Country. Uh, and as their website explains, uh, the history of that phrase is that back in the olden days, the British would go into battle shouting, chanting, For King and Country sort of as an anthem of fighting for something that they believed wholeheartedly in. My response to that is, yes, quite. That was the olden days. That was a time of hierarchy, a time of deference, allegiance to the flag, feudal order, wars of nations, and the empire. As the girl guides have found, service to queen and country today smacks of a world that uh, has increasingly limited relevance. Since 1945, Europeans have sought to build international structures around shared values and not shared ethnicity. We've got NATO, we've got the EU, we've got the UN, we've got the G20, etc., etc., the World Trade Organization. We have enjoyed 70 years of peace in Europe by suppressing our nationalist urges. Go ahead. How well do you think the shared values of the Greeks and the Germans are working to diminish national differences at the moment in Europe? <laughs> I, I would say that uh, they're obvi obviously having a spat, but they haven't yet gone to guns. So, so it's working. <laughs> uh, but for those of you who may wish to fight... Uh, as the motion puts it, for queen and country, I would caution you to a serious cost-benefit analysis. Currently, the armed forces face a pay freeze and the loss of benefits and conditions. Indeed, a decorated former SAS commander who recently resigned from the army told me, the problem is the deal just doesn't add up anymore. Now, I won't say that soldiering is without any redeeming feature because soldiers are good company and they're extremely witty people to be around. Uh, but most of their humor is of the blackest type. And this, is because, and this is because of a basic truth of war, which is that it is, for the most part, mind-numbingly tedious. And then when something does happen, quite often it's something really awful. 
The American satirical newspaper The Onion did a recent skit on the release of a new computer game. It's called Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Modern Warfare 3, they promise, allows gamers to truly experience life in a war zone. Spend whole days hauling equipment and filling out paperwork in this immaculately rendered real-time game. <laughs> Dig holes in the sand. Walk down a road and get shot in the back. <laughs> Unfortunately, and this is more serious, my job takes me to a lot of funerals. That is only, and, and that is the only place where I ever hear any soldier mention fighting for Queen and Country. This was a funeral last year of a 19-year-old private from the Yorkshire Regiment. His commanding officer told me he was a young man who served Queen and his country and paid with his life. You can't do more than that. It's a nice sentiment. But then I went outside and I spoke to the young man's friends. This is what one of them told me. There were a few of them who joined up together. They wanted to keep away from temptation, drink and drugs and that. There's not a lot of work around here. It was ever thus. This is an American soldier in World War II interviewed by a US Army research unit. What are you fighting for? Ask any dog face in the line. You're fighting for your skin on the line. When I enlisted, I was patriotic as hell. There's no patriotism on the line. It was announced this week that 349 active duty soldiers from the US Army committed suicide in 2012 and that 295 died in combat. 6,500 US veterans killed themselves last year. We must be wary of overstating the emotional damage of war, but I echo the view that war isn't good for the soul. You will hear those, or you have heard those proposing the motion say that this country needs armed forces to fight for queen and country. They act as a deterrent to aggression, the safeguard of our values. This sounds a potent argument until, of course, you look at some of the wars we actually ask our troops to fight. This week, I received a new study from the International Institute of Strategic Studies, one of the top three think tanks in the country, though uh, Rusi is arguably better. Um, it's called Iraq, From War to a New Authoritarianism. It warns of renewed civil war or a new dictatorship under President Nouri al-Maliki which will stifle any chance of political opposition. Quote, with these two specters hanging over it, Iraq has the potential to once again menace its neighbors and destabilize the Gulf region. What then the trillion dollar war that we've fought for the last decade? This week, President Karzai also repeated his assertion that Helmand province became a violent place only when British troops arrived there. He added that he expects a serious, strong, good reduction in violence will occur when they leave. The government argues that Britain's presence in Afghanistan has helped to defeat al-Qaeda and keep the UK safe. The English Channel and a lot of police work has kept Britain safe. I am less certain that the presence of Western troops in Afghanistan and Iraq hasn't created more enemies than it has killed. The final argument that, we are like, that we've heard tonight is that when faced with an existential threat, we must all rally to the call of queen and country. Now, an existential threat is, of course, possible, though unlikely. What then? There are, I imagine, extreme circumstances where many of us here, perhaps a majority, may feel we have to fight an aggressor, someone who directly threatens us, our children, our family. In that instance, we would be fighting for our lives, for our families, for our children, our homes and we would not be fighting for queen and country. I'm not a pacifist, and I can fight for a principle. But if you volunteer to fight for queen and country, on recent form, you're going to be dispatched to fight pointless and possibly illegal wars. You will have to accept grim pay, grim conditions that are potentially very damaging to you as a person and very damaging to your family if you're killed. There are things worth fighting for, Queen and country isn't one of them. And for that reason, I call on you to oppose tonight's motion.
Thank you, Tom, and thank you to all our speakers this evening. A couple of very quick announcements. As ever, the result of tonight's debate will be announced in the bar in about 10 to 15 minutes. Also in the bar, you'll find a table on how to get involved in the union, which I'd certainly encourage everyone to do. This is the start of a very busy week at the union. On Monday, we have what promises to be a fascinating forum on the effects, positive and negative, of the internet on our lives and on society. On Wednesday, Sir Roger Penrose, a renowned physicist, will be speaking. And next Thursday, we will be debating the place of sex in modern society. So don't miss that one either. All that's left for me to say is thank you very much again to our speakers, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.